Top Bed Talk. This piece is divided into two parts. It's presented by Sol Aronson, tenure professor at Duke University, with his guests Angela Bader, Harvard Medical School, Vice Chair of Perioperative Medicine at Mass General Brigham, Bobby Jean Schweitzer, Professor of Anesthesiology and Director of Perioperative Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, and Gina Blitz, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and Director of the Perioperative Anesthesia and Surgery Screening Clinic. He's also Director of Perioperative Medicine Fellowship at Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. Enjoy. Let's go to the Slido screen. If you could please put that up and see what our audience is asking us to speak to. What is your opinion about spinals and hip fractures for patients on clopidogrel? Currently on it, I do not think that our anesthesia people would do a spinal for a hip fracture, um, just in general, is if that was what the question is referring to. And the regional guidelines now, I think, have been a little more liberal saying five to seven days instead of seven days. But, you know, in general, the uh, orthopedic anesthesiologists in our department are pretty much rigid about following the uh, the ASRA guidelines. I don't know how they are, you know, at your places. Yes, we would, we, our, regional anesthesiolo- our regional anesthesiologists would not perform a spinal on somebody who had taken clopidogrel no. outside of the ASRA no. guidelines. And the ASRA right. guidelines, I think, are, are still quite clear about yes. it's safe on with NSAIDs. It's safe with aspirin to perform spinal right. neuraxial anesthesia, right. but it is not safe to do that in any other with any other drug on board. Or if you think the effects of that drug, whether that's an anticoagulant or another antiplatelet, right? And that doesn't matter with a hip fracture, a baby, a woman having a baby. Right. Um, I don't think right. anybody yeah. feels like the benefits of a spinal or a neuroaxial anesthetic outweighs a patient who has ab- potentially abnormal clotting. Um, so right. again, NSAIDs and aspirin is fine, but nothing else. Right. And just this may be a, a common uh, question, just to emphasize what Bobby said is there is nothing about aspirin that would ever prevent a regional anesthesiologist in my department from doing any sort of regional anesthesia. So just to make that clear, because I do think sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about that, depending on the type of surgery type, but it will not impact us doing any sort of regional anesthetic. And the dose of aspirin honestly doesn't impact any of us doing a regional anesthetic, just to make that point clear. I think the other thing that I'll add, um, and our practice would be the same, we defer to the ASRA guidelines with regards to clopidogrel and other antiplatelet agents and neuraxial blockade. And for those in the audience, neuraxial blockade would include a spinal anesthetic and epidural anesthetic. So my point that I would add to what uh, the others have mentioned is our regional anesthesi- anesthesiologists, while they may not provide neuraxial, there are other regional techniques that can be safely performed even on a a patient who is currently on antiplatelets. So we're not suggesting that it's, um, you know, a spinal and that's, you know, no spinal and that's it. There might be other things that we can think about in terms of blocks that would be appropriate for a hip fracture in in spite of the fact that the patient has taken antiplatelet agents. Let me twist that a little bit. If a patient was um, determined to be an acceptable candidate for a neuroaxial block because there was sufficient... A, a holiday between um, their anticoagulant. When do you restart um, the anticoagulant for prophylaxis after uh, the patient has had an axial block? I, I believe we have ASRA guidelines that would guide us on that as well. So um, I don't know if I'm allowed to advertise that, but there's a great app, which is the ASRA app that many of us have on our phones, and you can quickly plug that in um, and, and see when to restart that. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that sometimes with the orthopedic um, patients, they will be on, again, they'll have an initiation of aspirin or something, even if they've not been on anticoagulation ahead of time as part of their uh, DVT prophylaxis afterwards. Um, but that, sh- again, shouldn't interfere with, with anything. Now, one important point is you don't need to memorize every single thing. And I think that's why I'm glad because... 
you know, um, I'm a big fan of checklists for a number of reasons, but I think to expect us in this day and age with everything changing, I think it's perfectly fine to say, you know what, I need to look this up. I need to look this up. You know, I don't think we can possibly expect people, even who are specialists in perioperative medicine, it's hard to keep all of this straight. And every time a new guideline comes out, it changes. So to be honest, I think maybe one of the most important things to do is know where to find the information when you need it. I think more than worrying about knowing every detail. The reason I ask is, um, I, I would just add this, though we know that data, or we remember once upon a time reading that data, and we know where to look for that data. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah. What, what often happens is that the decision to begin prophylaxis is not ours. It's it's the surgeons, right. and they don't right. know that data. And so there, yeah. I think, are sometimes, oftentimes, unnecessary delays in reinstituting the prophylaxis right. for the DVT right. because of fear. How do we bridge that gap better? <laughs> Education and and multidisciplinary management, I think. And, yes. you know, I don't know that we haven't gotten into that sphere yet, but I think there's a role for the perioperative physician for things like that postoperatively also. I don't know that a lot of institutions, and ours certainly hasn't gotten into it yet, but that's part of developing the continuum of care. Um, I wish we could. Uh. I think that even if we're not at the stage where we can directly control that or manage that postoperatively, it shouldn't prevent us preoperatively from pausing and asking that question directly and saying, team, when do we think would be the right time to restart this, this medication? Our guidelines would suggest X. Is there any reason to believe that there's something different about this case Otherwise, shall we plan on this so that at least we're all starting from the expectation that we're going to be adhering to, you know, best evidence unless we deviate from the plan because something changes intraoperatively or postoperatively. I would suggest that even if we're not to the ideal state, which we aren't either, there's still a value in having that discussion preoperatively in a non-pressured fashion um, and documenting it. Right. So here's a practical question. We talked about the general trend to bridge less and less. When do you bridge? Mm -hmm. Well, I I have some general guidelines. Um, One of the more common things is people who have had a clot when anticoagulation has been stopped before. That's a pretty easy one. I'm just trying to put these in categories. The few people that we see with um, really mechanical valves. And then um, again, the situation comes up of do you bridge depending on how recent it is to a PE, DVT, you know, things like that. And then I'm not going to get into Chad's VASC, which was covered very well in Jenna's talk. But um, I would say if we're talking about bigger categories, those are the ones I deal with most frequently. I would just add that we think about this first from the perspective of if you're on a DOAC, we essentially assume you are, we aren't going to bridge you. We're going to keep you moving. Yeah, so yeah. that's why on, on our flow sheet, what you'll see is the only people we really pause around are patients who are on warfarin and at high risk of venothromboembolism from one of the three categories. Either the type of mechanical heart valve that they have makes them high risk because they have multiple thrombophilias or a thrombophilia where they've clotted through anticoagulation in the past, as Angela was saying. Um, or have had a VTE within the last three months, or Chad's VASC that's, you know, greater than six or seven. Even on warfarin, because if not, you know, keep it moving. Um, and then if they are on warfarin, do they meet one of these very, very high risk categories, which are going to be very rare? So if I could just add briefly to that, I would say that I, you know, I encountered this in my own institution where it was confusing, especially to our APPs and and people outside of clinic often, where we said if you had a clot while you were off anticoagulants, uh, what we mean by that is is if you stop it in that short period of time before surgery and you had a clot, 
because you will yeah. encounter many people or you know several patients in your your practices who you know have had a clot. They complete their three, you know, symptoms in the past. It'd be six months of therapy. Then they would go another ten years and have another clot. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Many yeah. of those were you know provoked or not provoked. That doesn't count as being you know having right. a clot off anticoagulant. Mm -hmm. What we're talking mm -hmm. about is you know I'm on anticoagulation all the time. I stop it for a week or a few days, and I had a clot during that period. The other thing I think is important is that one checks the PT INR before you decide to stop your warfarin. Many, many mm -hmm. patients out there, you know, that's, are going to true. have either, you know, too high of INRs, they're going to be over anticoagulated or too low of INRs, then they're going to be under anticoagulated. And then you may be mis miscalculating the time that they're quote unquote off or not off if you've just used standard, you know, like warfarin five, stop it five days ahead of time. Um, so, you know, when we have an older patient and we have a PT, um, at the higher end of their normal range or even too high, we encounter sometimes an INR of 3, 3.5. You know, frankly, we're not going to bridge that person, right, even if they're in a high-risk category because we're going to mm -hmm. stop. And, in fact, we're going to be bringing them in the day before and checking their PT INR to make sure that they've actually normalized where the reverse is true. Many patients aren't terribly compliant with their, their warfarin doses or they may be non-compliant with their diets. And so you'd be surprised how many people you check their PT INR and it's non-therapeutic. You know, it's, their INR is 1.8 and they're still on warfarin. Well, if they've, most of the time we don't say take extra warfarin or let's bridge you right now. We think, you know, you're not even anticoagulant right now. You're not clotting. You're probably going to be fine, you know, especially if you're on the lower risk category. So I do think it takes a thinking, breathing clinician who yes. can yes. understand anticoagulation and the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of these drugs and the, and the pathophysiology um, and apply those. That doesn't mean it has to be an individual, you know, patient. It's just these are the caveats that you should consider as you go through your algorithm or as you look to apply those guidelines. Uh, but I agree with all of the, my co-panelists, and those are the big categories of people that, and only the categories of people who may need bridging. And frankly, you know, again, back to those ones that have had a VTE within three months, you have to ask yourself, why are we doing the mm -hmm. surgery, yeah, right? right? I mean, exactly. clearly there's a lot of surgeries that probably need to happen within three months. You've got cancer, you've got something else, but you know, you're not going to be doing a total knee replacement. Or you shouldn't be, or a spine surgery most likely in a patient who hasn't completed their full course of anticoagulation for a recent VTE. I'd like to just add one anecdotal story because I, I think it might resonate with some of you in the audience. Um, and that's to piggyback off of what Dr. Schweitzer was just saying. We had a patient in the recent past in our clinic who was on warfarin. Um, and of course, we you know checked her INR and it was extremely high. And Despite the fact that she was coming for a very low risk procedure, low EDL, et cetera, this led us down the path of further investigation about her nutritional status, which was extremely poor. She was not only frail, she was very malnourished. And um, actually, I personally think that the best thing that we did for her was preoperative nutritional optimization, let alone getting her coordinated in terms of coming off of her uh, you know, warfarin. So the warfarin was actually some, you know, small little thing that, thank God, led us to further investigation that led to a much larger, more important issue, which was her nutritional optimization. And kudos to you and your team, because this is, again, you know, emphasize, I don't, I'm not sure a farm D or a pharmacy tech would have had that same sort of insight into that. Right. I can't right. emphasize yeah. enough that I think as we practice this, we realize that we're practicing preoperative and perioperative medicine. We don't want to protocolize everything or dumb it down so much that we're, you know, are, 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 we don't, we're not offering a real you know, 360 view with these patients at their total risk, their right. a complete yeah. evaluation. Um, and sometimes these little things like this, that would have seemed to be a completely different, isolated thing, outlier, led to a whole different risk assessment and management of this patient. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, I can't help but think, I, thank you. I agree uh, passionately with that, that last statement. It just strikes me as, I, I guess frustrating, maybe perverse is too strong, but certainly um, awkward in that 
Um, that's that scenario, that anecdote that you just shared, uh, truly is the practice of medicine. I would argue mm-hmm. not incident to the surgical care, and yet we we mm-hmm. so often struggle with with our current payment policy, if you'll constraints, yeah. to figure out how we can be recognized for the work we do in order to tee right. our patients up to tolerate the perturbation of surgery best. Just a little uh, soapbox there. I'll get back off my soapbox and and go back to Slido now. Do you use any near patient tests to confirm residual anticoagulation? Not a problem, such as, uh, I guess, the, I'll call them point of cares, TAG or Rotem or platelet function tests. Um, I guess the question is, do you see a use for those sort of rapid response tests in a perioperative, preoperative clinic scenario? So the brief answer is no, not in our clinic. We do have this built into our spine protocol where uh, TAG, Rotem um, are included in some of the spine intraoperative pathways in terms of point of care testing. But no, we are not using that in our clinic. Yeah, we aren't either. So my answer is pretty brief. (laughs) Also, not routinely used in the pre-op area. Should we? We're seeing patients often too far in advance to to have that make sense. Um, Remember that the majority of patients that we're seeing are still on their DOAC or their warfarin when we're meeting them. Um, I guess maybe what you're asking is, should we have them come back closer to surgery to do that? But then I wonder about the burden um, and the, the cost for the patient of coming back to our clinic as opposed to having that successfully performed on the day of surgery? I don't know the answer, but that's just what's coming to mind. Yeah. I think that we, the ASRA guidelines would have to, at least in the United States, would have to catch up with that, right? I think it makes a lot of sense to, to, to think that these te- tools could be very, very useful for many patients, right? Because now we basically you know, do this on time or we you know, send off an expensive uh, test you know, that takes a while to get back or we just don't know, like a you know, 10A level or something, or we just don't know what to do. But I think, unfortunately, in the medical legal climate of the U.S., until ASRA says, you know, hey, yeah. it's okay to go ahead and do a Rotem, and if you get normal results, you can proceed, I, I doubt that we're, it's going to be widely adopted, especially yeah. without uh, yeah. some more evidence-based, you know, information to, to guide us. Good point. Um, Slido, please. Um, where are the guidelines published? I guess somebody wants to know what oh. app you showed everybody, Bobby. Um, but in brief, there are ACC AHA guidelines, there's the pause trial, and there are the ASRA guidelines. So I'm going to pivot on that question a little bit and ask you to address this modified version of that question. I think the guidelines exist. There are many. I think you collated them nicely into a practical use for purposes of perioperative medicine. So my question is, when are you going to publish your cookbook approach that consolidates the guidelines? Well, thank you so much for that intro. As you know, um, one of our current residents who is very interested in perioperative medicine under your fantastic mentorship and, and my advisorship is, is working on, on approaching such topic. We'll see how this goes. Wish us luck, but hopefully sometime soon we'll have a user-friendly approach that we can share with others who are interested. Great. And, I, and I don't mean to call, though I am, though I am biased, I, I, I guess I would put it to uh, both um, you, Angela, and, and, and Bobby. Um, do, you, do you see, if you take yourselves out of the picture here because you have uh, a breadth of knowledge that is, I think, extraordinary. Do you see a need for the general uh, practicing, if you will, anesthesiologist in a, in a preoperative clinic to have that kind of a reference guide to help um, make sense of the myriad of guidelines that are out there right now? And, and that's a leading question, but I'm asking you to be practical and speak to it as best you can with your finger on that pulse. Yeah, I mean, I'll start. My answer would be yes, but I will tell you a little anecdote. You know, I was one of the authors on the emergency checklists, and we wanted everyone to be using the emergency checklist, but the problem is how do you keep them updated? 
And that was one of our, I mean, if we have such a reference, it would have to be able to be updated in some uh, regular way or because yes, I do think it's valuable just like, I mean, I would say Bobby's book is probably the closest we have. And now that's mm -hmm. in our third edition. And even so we have to be careful that, you know, I tell the residents, be sure you get the third edition, not the second edition. So the question is, how do you keep these things updated in enough so that people out in private practice really are using the most current guidelines? Um, I don't know, Bobby, is your book going to go virtual and do stuff? I don't know. Is there a way to do these editions in a way that um, we can update it yeah, in, you know, in real time? Yeah, you know, I think that that's what it is. It has to be, you know, books are basically outdated. It's like cars, right? You drive your car off the parking lot. Unfortunately, right. now the value drops by, you know, 50% or something. So books are outdated by the time they get published. And I think that, but, you know, that's at least monetarily, that's the way sort of things have been set up, right, for publishers and for everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think it's having apps like the ASRA guideline app and having right. apps and, and, and things on the web that you do, right? I agree with you because things are just moving. But I think this is what, you know, the Cochrane Collaborative have has tried to do. This is yeah. what up to date, you know, tries to do. Right. I mean, there are right. platforms out there. It's just when it gets down to an individual person, it's often a little bit harder to constantly be, right. you know, looking at the literature right. and constantly updating it. And, and um, I'd like to, Saul, if it's okay, digress here a little bit, just because while we're here, you know, I looked on my web. I have my phone right here and I looked at the BJA article. And to apologies to all of those people outside of the United States who don't, you know, we know we're the center of the world. But, you know, remember, we're number one in COVID, number one in COVID deaths and, and, and you know, yeah. cases. We like to be number one. Um, you know, the, this guideline, this, this article is very, very interesting. And it says, yeah, it says the Association of Anesthesis Guideline. I think I said that correctly as a, uh, ex a not a, a non-British person. The Association of Anesthesis Guideline therefore adopts a pragmatic approach to anticoagulation when spinal anesthesia is deemed superior to GA. For example, with severe chest pain for a patient awaiting hip fracture repair. They, they say specifically single antiplatelet therapy, including clopidogrel, is not a contraindication to spinal anesthesia. In fact, spinal anesthesia may be appropriate for patients taking dual antiplatelet therapy for those who are suit, unsuitable for GA on a risk-benefit basis. Fascinating. Comes down to risk um, versus benefit, doesn't it always? It, is, it all comes yeah. down to risk-benefit. Yeah. It's, it, you know, yeah. having yeah. drugs for a number of years, if you had a preeclamptic that came in with low platelets, it was risk-benefit we put in the epidural. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I kind of put this article in that same category that you're always having to balance risk-benefit. Um, no, so I would say that when it comes to... Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. So when it comes to, you know... I'm just I'm just not certain that we have enough evidence. And believe me, yeah. I'm a huge fan of avoiding general anesthesia. But I, and I do think if any patients, it may be hip fracture patients or joint replacement patients or pregnant patients who there may be some distinct benefits from avoiding GA. But I don't know how much those benefits are. Exactly. And I think that's, that's relatively vague. Um, and so, you know. It is an interesting, You're though, approach. Right. And at, yeah. at least their Association of Anesthetists came out with that recommendation. So I, think I appreciate you looking good, that up. Yeah, I, I think that's a good place to close. Um, we're out of time. It went faster than we thought it would. Um, I think at the close, I just simply say this is complex stuff, um, though I think we um, have done a really good job in this panel to make uh, sense out of what was heretofore opaque. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank and, you. Uh, Thanks. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. 
if you check out ebpom.org you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home check out ebpom.org now